Welcome back to Science Fiction and Fantasy Read-Along. Thank you for joining us for Episode 2, Chapter 2, The Discussion of Gardens of the Moon. It is undeniably a direct continuation of Episode 1. They were originally a single episode. As you may recall from the end of Episode 1, we were in discussion about a, an excerpt from the book Call to Shadow by Felicin, the youngest sister of Gano's Perrin. We pick up right where we left off. So let me not get in the way. Enjoy. What can we pull out of this excerpt from Call to Shadow? It talks about how the Maranth changed the way the war was. Right. And we recall earlier that the Maranth were given credit for some kind of... Yeah, like a technological advance or something. Right. It was in the war's 12th year, the year of the shattered moon. That's funny. Yeah, I think we know what that means. And Blackwing Promise, blah, blah, blah. Anything else you guys want to pull out of there? All right, let's get started with chapter two, yes? Okay, go for it. Far to the east on the continent Genabacus, for three years, moon spawn has floated above the city of Pale. The presence of the fortress and its rumored master has stalled the advances of the Malazan's second army. Encamped upon the plain outside of Pale, the second army's wizard cadre has been summoned to an unscheduled gathering at High Fist Dujek One Arm's command tent. It's been two years since the slaughter at the beach in Itkokan. Well, it starts with Tattersail and Kala. They're two of the wizards in a cadre. Uh, I, I think I mentioned it earlier that a full cadre is seven wizards. This is a cadre of three. Don't really know why but they, they're not at full strength. This cadre is not. How does this chapter start? Oh, that's a good point, Yule. So what we've done, Yule, is in the interest of clarity, we have reorganized this chapter chronologically. Mm. We're going to go from the beginning to the end, and we're not going to tolerate any of this jumping around in time that gets so confusing. One of the reasons that this chapter is confusing is because it jumps around in time. I agree. So we're taking we're taking that well, element out. Well, I think for a reader, I think a reader can follow it much more easily. But if we're trying to describe it, it just gets chaotic and confusing and incoherent. I think it was artfully done, but it did not add to clarity. Even though it's him, and even though I appreciate it, I just think it doesn't add to clarity. It only adds to confusion. All right, so. Callet, a wizard, and Tattersail, a wizard, mm. so are a couple. They've been sleeping together. She has ascribed less importance to it than she really feels. Truthfully, yeah, exactly. So I hate to divert the line of reasoning here. You said that a normal cadre is seven wizards? Yes. And now we have, but three here? There's only two so far, but we'll meet a third in just a second. All right. My point here is... Thank you very much. Fascinating. Pause. Pause <laughs> yeah, exactly. for dramatic effect. Pausing. Uh -huh. From the very beginning of the book, the prologue, Lacine has had a pressure against witchcraft and wizardry. She's obviously looking to control them. And so now we're understaffed. And she runs around with an adjunct that's against magic. Yeah, anathema to magic. Yeah. So I think there's a sign here. I mean... I do too. And I'm glad you pointed that out because I hadn't really even thought about it. it. It normally would be, I think, here, but I think it's it's specifically like who they're, you know, what's, well, I don't want to say. Let's, let's, yeah, let's get there when we get there. Well, okay. So it's coming. It's coming. So the foreshadowing here is you've got Blurden and you've got Night something. Night Chill. Night Chill. Wait, okay. why are we talking about them right now? Though? No, we're talking yeah, about it right yeah, now because so later. They, have, they have been blackballed. And pull and put into like a know nothing position for years, almost a decade, six years. But most recently, Bellardin, who's like this Thelemon giant, oh. he's also a wizard. We he's been told to go out and Gandalf this whole situation and figure out what <laughs> Moonspawn's all about. <laughs> That's exactly correct. Oh, good reference. Good reference. So, um, so again, another way that he's been on the sideline, but most recently. This information that he's been going out and getting is going to be used for this meeting that we're going to be starting in a second. Yes, but the only reason they called him back in is because he was useful. Let's do this in order, though, please. 
I thought we were. <laughs> no, this is completely out of order. <laughs> completely out. I had a relevant point to make. And it was made. And now we're going to start the chapter. All right, go for it. We've been introduced to two wizards who are lovers, who are summoned. They're on their way. They pause briefly so Tattersail can observe Moonspawn. Mm -hmm. We have had hints of up until now. It, it, we know it's a fortress. We know it's massive. What we know about it right now is that there is a lord of Moonspawn and then there's the person who's leading all the troops, basically, named Kaladin Brood. And they're allied, but they're not together. Tattersail paused outside the tent and turned to study the enormous mountain hanging suspended a quarter mile above the city of Pale. She scanned the battered face of Moonspawn, its name for as long as she could remember. Ragged as a blackened tooth, the basalt fortress was home to the most powerful enemy the Malazan Empire had ever faced. They talk about Lassine's undead army, the Talon Imas. They should be able to like do something about this. It seems that they're either unable or unwilling to penetrate the magical defenses that this fortress has. Okay, so tell me and tell our listeners how the Talon Imas could possibly hope to get up there when it's a quarter mile in the air. So they're like undead. They're kind of like zombie skeletons that kind of disintegrate and reform in other places yes it says it says in that description that you just read that they can travel as easily as dust on the wind right but for some reason they're either unable or unwilling to do that and then that okay. makes me question their desire <laughs> yeah exactly their will <laughs> so that's moon spawn and it's just floating in the city above pale and that's what Tattersail pauses to look at. Callot tells her, look, Hairlock is impatient. We need to go. So they continue on their journey to Dujek One Arm's command tent. When they arrive in the command tent, they see uh, Tashrin, the, the high mage of the entire Malazan Empire. He's the high mage in the Imperium. And he's purposefully studying this battle map. And Tattersail and Callot are like, are you kidding me? He couldn't read a battle map. There's no way. It's such a studied pose. What a poser. They're making fun of this guy. And then the chair, the darkness in one of the chairs speaks to them. <laughs> and we are introduced to Hairlock. There's a lot of mention about Tattersail's weight. She's a plumper woman. And she even mentions that Hairlock is lucky that she didn't sit on him. <laughs> Because uh, he was essentially invisible. They right. couldn't see him at all. And he made his crack at them or whatever. And she's like, you're lucky I didn't sit on you. I would not call it rivalry, but let's just call it friction. She doesn't like him. She doesn't like him. He doesn't like her. They have a professional relationship, but they don't like each other. And she even compares him to Tashrin, who obviously she doesn't like either. Either way. I'm just saying. Reader be warned. I like Hairlock. <laughs> He, he cracks me up as well. I, I think he's great, personally. I remember the first time I read the book, though, I really didn't like the guy. And I, I, couldn't, have, I couldn't tell you why, but in the rereading, I think he's pretty funny. And I appreciate his, his bravery. We'll yeah, he totally it. takes one for the team. Do you guys recall the recruiting sergeant's headache? Yeah. Yes, uh, Tattersail is starting to get a real bad migraine. Why does she get migraines? I think it's somebody in the room. Yeah, it's emanations of power, right? Yes. She's sensitive to the power that certain wizards put off or certain people in general. And uh, I believe Callot is also sensitive to it, but he, get, he, he tears up. His eyes water as a response, whereas she gets headaches. So I, th I think this is a kind of a little wink, wink, nod, nod, letting us know that Sari, the recruit, was potent. And that that sergeant was a little bit sensitive to it. Now we're starting to get an understanding of how people can sense magic. It's not just that you see the magic. Some people are actually sensitive to its very presence and you know, the power itself. And that is how Kalat smells that Tashrin is present. Dujek one arm is present as well. So tell me what's it all about, Yule. Why are they here? What's this meeting about? This meeting has two purposes. The very first one, which you're going to elaborate on, is the fact that Claw are in the city. And if you remember correctly, <laughs> the Claw are Lacine's private group that she has going out and killing folk. 
the assassin cult. Yeah. Well, specifically, they're hunting down Pale's wizards. That is what they are told. Again, I want to emphasize that Lacine has something against wizards. Okay. When Dujak tells them that there's a claw in the city of Pale, they are in the city, he says. So a claw is plural. Claw is not necessarily singular. It's both, right? And there are multiple claw in the city going after the wizards of Pale. And I will counter what Philip just said by noting that it makes sense. Pale is run by wizards. They're the ruling class. They should be the ones taken out. Like they are the biggest threat to what's about to happen. They can help defend the city. And if they're gone, obviously their power is gone. Yes, she definitely has something against wizards, as we have seen, but I don't think it is an unwarranted animosity towards your enemy's wizards. I think it makes perfect sense to take the wizards out first. No disagreement. You take out their capital pieces. Yep. But it is Dudrek, isn't it, that says, man, those guys will go after anybody, including Malazans? That's, well, that's what Tattersail's thinking, and oh, Calot, okay. Calot offers this up. If they're here for any other reason, and then Dujek assures them they're going to have to go through me first. Oh, I see. But now I want to know, because I am super, super confused, why they're not even startled at the, at the possibility that the claw would come for them. Why is this not surprising? Why is it that they assume that they might be there for another reason, and then that reason might be to go after them? They must have done it before. They must be expecting that they're expendable and that maybe Philip's point is very true, that Lacine makes no, she's making no bones about it. She's getting rid of wizards. They just treat it like it's a statement of fact, no big deal. And when I read that, I was kind of startled. You guys understand what I'm getting at? Well, well, Herlock gets it. When it's disclosed that the claws are in the city going after the Pale's wizards, Herlock says, they'll go to ground. They're wizards, not idiots. And it was a moment before... Tattersail understood the man's comment. Oh, right. Pale's wizards. Yeah, Pale's wizards. That's right. <laughs> I, I don't know what to take from that, really. I mean, I'm, I'm a little well, bit... They don't trust those fools. That's what it is. They, are kind of, they kind of expect Lacine to gun for them, is what it sounds like to me. It does sound that way, yes. All right. So that was the first piece of information. There's the, the wizards are under siege already in Pale. What's the second piece of information? The second piece of information is that from Lacine's own mouth that these guys are going to take on Moonspawn. Within Caladan, the hour. Yeah, within the hour. Yeah. Caladan Brood is away with a whole bunch of people, <laughs> and they think this is the right time to do it. Of course, everybody is like, this is a suicide mission. We're going to get taken out by the guy who's still over there. And then they have this big old conversation about who that might be. And it gets pretty heated. It's a very tense scene. And I think with rereading, it feels even more tense. No, I agree completely. You know more about it. They don't think that things are going to go very well and that this is really just, it's not going to be great. <sighs> I agree with you. They're being given orders. They're being told what they're going to do today, which is work. They're going to do work, as Herlock calls it. And that work is very dangerous. And they're up against one wizard, they think. One wizard is alone up in that tower. An archmage, though. Yeah, Herlock points out, oh, he's not just a wizard. Come on, give me a break, Tayshrin. Tell, tell it true. Even Dujek calls him out on it. Says, tell it like it really is, buddy. He's like, all right, this is what it's really like. We don't know who this guy is. And he's like, that's some BS. Hairlock thinks he knows who it is. And they almost, I mean, it's like, it's getting tense. And Calot is like dabbing at his eyes because he can't stop the tears. And, and Tattersail's head is just pounding and pounding because the power between these two guys is intense. They start talking about Caladan Brood, which kind of gets Tattersail thinking about a poem. Yes, it does. Why are they talking about Caladan Brood? He's basically the guy who's been leading all the armies of that moon spawn against. In against, opposition. Yeah, yeah. In opposition, opposition to Malazan armies up in the north. And he is winning. Right. He is wiping the floor with the Malazan armies. And he's almost done. He's wiped out two out of three armies. Is that and, correct? Yeah. And they're afraid that if he could come back any day with his army. 
And they've only been fighting to a standstill anyway. It's under siege. They're sieging. They're trying to undermine the wall right. through a glacial gravel pile, which was insanity. Well, yes, the, that is insanity. They said they've been doing it for years. <laughs> they've been here for three years. This conversation's getting heated. Dujek points out that the real reason that they're attacking today is because Cal Brew could be back any day now. I don't remember what Herlock was implying. He was accusing Tayshrin of wanting to attack these guys for a particular reason. He's yeah, like, he totally does. Doesn't he? Well, they're getting hung up on the name for sure. Tayshrin keeps denying that he knows who's up there. And Herlock is like, you know full well who's up there. And he's like, I don't, no, I don't. And who's your source of information that makes you so sure that you know? And then Dujek's like, look, we're doing it now because we have no choice. We need to attack before it gets really out of hand. Well, Herlock does say, he's like, the just Andy, our mother's dark first children. You felt the rumors through the warrants of sorcery, Tasha, and so have I. There's something that Herlock says just before they get their actual orders. He says to Tasha, this plan stinks. It's got your smell to it, as it were. Remember back in Aaron? Herlock does. They were on opposing sides when the Malazans were taking the city of Aaron. And so Herlock is familiar with the strategies and the tactics used by Tasha. And he says, this plan, it's yours. I can smell it. And he's hinting at something. And Tattersail knows it. And by the look on Dujak's face, he knows it too. But nobody's saying what it is. Well, I know. But it, it, it's, at that same talk, Herlock says, who then are the other three high mages? Let me guess. And I have no idea where this came from, but Herlock was on it. And Herlock was on it. As in, with three more mages... You now have a cadre of seven. I don't think that's significant, honestly, because the high mages do not go in cadres. Yeah, okay, but he said, let me guess, because Herlock already knew what was going on with the wizards. Herlock was very, yeah. And he knew that the three wizards that were brought in. He was guessing out loud, essentially. But notice he never actually guessed. He never stated out loud what he thought. And I, I, I think I understand why. Oh, you think he's involved? I think that if he says it out loud, if he expresses his, his doubts out loud, it would be viewed as, as sedition, like trying to influence Dujek against Tayshrin. And Tayshrin would have every right at that point to have him executed. Okay. It's a guess. It's a guess. Well, the point is, Herlock said, you need three more wizards. Who are the three other wizards? And that came out of the blue. And guess what? Tayshrin invited three more wizards. And Herlock knew exactly who they were. Right. Okay, so one of the things that he uses to support his choice, they're like this, the, the choice to attack today is partly supported by Bellurden's research. So we got Bellurden searching records on Moonspawn and what this thing is all about and how they can go about uh, you know, basically attacking it. Right, so th basically they're getting intelligence right. on the Tisty Andy, trying to get some insight into the Lord of Moonspawn's mindset and like what might make him leave the battlefield. Cause he's left Moonspawn has, has abandoned a battlefield against the Malazans before. When, when Kellenved was the emperor. Right. They're using this new discovery of parchments and scrolls from Galthos Folly as a kind of piece of intelligence that will, it made it help to make the decision. Let's do it. Let's do it now. All right. So uh, Tayshirin says enough is enough. We're attacking within the hour. Prepare your warrens. They did quote Gothos's folly a little bit. Is, they that, did? is that right? It's uh, from Fisher Keltaf. The poem is called Anna Manderis. Before everybody leaves, I mean, do you think it's fair to say they know who the guy is up there? Yeah. The Lord of Moon Spawn. He's the Lord of the Tisty Andy. Yep. Who are the souls of Starless Night. Rake the main of chaos. That's who the moon's lord is. Anamander Rake. And so what, the son of Mother Dark. The first children of Mother Dark, because she had other children. Yes. Do you guys have any idea what Herlock is hinting at? Yeah. You mean the three mages? Not just the three mages. Like, Tattersail's pretty sure that he's hinting at something. And she's trying to figure it out. And she thinks that Dujek is up on it and knows what he's hinting at. What do you guys think it is? I never expressed. He, he totally thinks that people that are from before time, before Lacine are getting whacked. Some you form know. of treachery. Because all the people that are coming, so the three mages are what? Nightchill, Bellardin, and that. At Karenus. Well, I think Herlock called it out. I mean, it, he said the plan was horrible. I mean, they're. He's setting them up for failure. I think that when he said that this plan stinks of your 
work. It's a way of laying blame on him specifically. He's saying essentially that it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter who gave the orders, this plan, when it, when it unfolds. And when you see what happens, remember that this plan was made by Tatian. Tatian was given an objective and this is his plan to accomplish that objective. And Herlock figures it out and calls him out on it. Yep. He calls him out on it. Not, not completely directly, but pretty directly. And uh, Tattersail is under the impression that Dujek is the one that's being betrayed. That's on page 67, if you want to look. Down at the very bottom. The high fist was being betrayed by someone somewhere. And if Tatrin was part of it, and we know Tatrin's part of it. He's planning it. Whoever told him to do it, probably the Empress, but Tatrin is planning it. He is complicit, right? I think that's what Hairlock is trying to communicate to Dujek, Tattersail, and Callet. There was this one scene where at the very beginning when Tattersail enters the room and sees Dujek, she's like, man, this guy is 79, but he looks like he's 50. Yeah. And, uh, and she's like, this three years of us doing, oh, that's right. This three years of us really doing nothing has been a tonic. And by the end of this meeting, he looked like an old man again. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Well, that I mean, was really was, cool. This was a stressful meeting. Yeah. I read it and reread it and reread it to try to understand what all was being said because it's real cagey. Airlock is not being overt. He's, he's being super, super KG, he definitely knows something is up. And I guess we can just go on. Are you guys ready? Yeah. A raid on the plain, the second army and its wizards bristle before battle. All right, so we have... The, I'm, I'm having a hard time picturing it because he doesn't really explain it too, too terribly well. We know there's the city of Pale and it's got a wall around it. And we know that there's a plain outside of the city and there are three hills on that plane. And Moonspawn is hanging over the city, directly over the city. And one of those hills is closest. That's where Tashrin is, all by himself. Obviously, he's surrounded. The whole plane is covered in soldiers that are just waiting to, to flood into the city when it falls, once Moonspawn is gone or out of the picture. 9,000 soldiers or something like that. And then there's a second hill, which I think is further back, further away from the city. And then a third one even further back. Is that how you guys pictured it? Yes. So it was in a, it was in a like sequential line farther and farther away? Yes. Okay. So the middle hill has Bellardin, Nightchill, and Acaronis. The three summoned wizards. The three summoned wizards who've been on the bench for six or seven years. They've been mothballed by the army. Except for the Gandalfing that Yule was talking about. We're given a little bit of history about them. Acaronis was left hanging when the Talon and Mass originally abandoned the field of battle when Calamvid was assassinated. They would not bow down to Lacine. So they left. And apparently that poor wizard took a beating because of it. Nightchill and Belurden don't really know anything about what they they're were. Lovers. We, yep, they're lovers. They're longtime, lifelong companions is how they're described. They've been with the Malazan Empire for a long time. I don't know how long, but there's some mention of them being around for a while. And then on the backmost hill, so in order of power, I suppose, the you know, high mage closest, the three high wizards in the middle, and then the cadre, the, you know, the low, you know, low on numbers cadre in the very back with Kala, Harlock, and Tattersail. And then obviously they're surrounded on all sides by soldiers. Now, if I was, if I was the high wizard, or if I was Dujek, and I was about to begin a sorceress enfilade on a floating fortress hovering above a city, I don't think I would have my soldiers anywhere near those wizards. Do you remember how it starts? I mean, what's the first thing that happens? Tashrin uh, attacks Moonspawn, basically destroying sections of it as like pieces of it fall into the, the city. Yeah, but they also fall on friendly soldiers. They sure do. I mean, they're, and it kills their own soldiers. Yeah, it destroys a whole bunch of people. Yeah, and it did fall down into the city, which... And then what, like ravens come out? 
great ravens erupt off the surface of moon spawn and fly to safety. No, this is what he's like. Imagine a Lord who's kept 30,000 great ravens well fed. 30,000. They're big too. 15 foot wingspan. I mean, they're as big as a condor or bigger. When Anna Amanda Rake makes his appearance, we get, we get as much information about him as we've ever gotten. Main of chaos, Anna Amanda Rake, Lord of the Black Skin Tistandi, who has looked down on a hundred thousand winters, who has tasted the blood of dragons, who leads the last of his kind, seated in the throne of sorrow, and a kingdom tragic and fey, a kingdom with no land to call its own. Okay. He sounds sympathetic. <laughs> he sounds old. Well, he sounds like a badass, too. 100,000 years old. Now, That's what we're dealing with here. Okay, so Dujek is 80, basically, 79 years old. This wizard that they're going up against is 100,000 years old. Tattersail's like 219. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so that's the description of Andermander Rake. That's the best information we've gotten so far. If you guys recall, Hairlock was suspicious that he knew who these uh, wizards were that had been summoned. When he was asked about it on the hill right before the battle, he said, mm-hmm, yeah, he was pretty smug about having guessed correctly. He knew that this was Anamander Rake. He was trying to get Tashrin to admit that he also knew that it was Anamander Rake and was kind of asking the question, why just seven wizards? Why four high wizards and a cadre when you're going up against this guy? Which gives us, the reader, the idea that Anamander Rake not just 100,000 years old. If Hairlock thinks that this guy is way too much for them to handle, we're supposed to believe that. You know, we're supposed to kind of go along with this idea. He's an expert in the subject. He should know. Tatrin's kind of evasive behavior suggests that, yeah, maybe he did underpower. You know, he, maybe he is a little bit underpowered. Well, no. Hairlock said when they're having the meeting in Dujek's tent, you felt the tremors through the warrens of sorcery, Tatrin. So have I. Ask Dujek about the reports coming down from the North Campaign. Elder Magic, Kerald Galain, the Lord of Moon's Spawn is the Master Archmage. You know his name as well as I do. And then he denies it. He won't admit it. Or he's, he's allowing the plan to go forward. Not as well prepared as it should be, perhaps, with not as much magical power behind it. Nevertheless, he seems confident. So the conflagration, what is, it, what is important about this? this well, Anamanda Rake is attacking back. Yeah, he gets, he gets blasted upon, and he does. He, he, he responds, but not in kind. He, he has a different approach, doesn't he? Well, I thought it was just like blasting the whole place. Indiscriminate. He's yes. not aiming at all. Well, let's, 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 let's skip to the end. I mean, let's just say that let's all... Let's not skip to the end. No, we'll not skip to the end. But let's just say that all hell breaks loose. People are dying, and there's, like, waves of, like, magical force, like, blowing apart, like, thousands of soldiers at a time. His initial barrage, his return fire, as it were, onto the high mage Tashrin, sends Tashrin to his knees. Stalks of dead grain, I believe, is how it's described. All of the soldiers around him die. They just wither and die, and their corpses are already rotten. And that's Corald Gulain. That's the magic of chaos, the warren of chaos. But he's just sending down indiscriminate fire. He's not aiming at anybody in particular. He's just blasting broad area of effect spells. Very, very powerful. Devastating. But the entire time, Tashrin is diverting the magic away from him killing his own soldiers in the process, diverting it over there, diverting it over there, keeping himself alive, but continuously keeping up his attack on Moonspawn. He never stops. How does it go? Who's the first one to go down? It's Hairlock, isn't it? Hairlock. Hairlock gets blasted. A wave of magic hits him, but something's wrong. Something's not right. It comes from the wrong direction. Where does it come from? This is what I mean, though. I have a hard time picturing it. Well, it comes from in front, which is uh, where Tashrin is. No, it, it, it says it doesn't come from Moonspawn. Down below. Small to the side. It comes from the plane. Herlock noticed it, but couldn't get his defenses up in time. Kalot noticed it. What happened to Herlock? He gets blown apart. I mean, basically blown in half. I mean, yeah, by who? It destroys his, the lower half of his body. It said completely. his guts are hanging out and yeah. his legs are gone. I mean, it's nasty. Kalot notices what's going on. 
with a look of terror in his eyes, looking at the plane where the attack came from that took out Harlock. Yes. And he raises his defenses not to protect himself, to protect Tattersail. And then he just he evaporates, essentially. He turns into a ball of fire, and he's gone. And one of Tattersail's mental defenses gets taken out right then and there as well. But she's still up. But then she's just defense. She's all, nothing but defense at that point. And only defending her for herself also. Yeah, she went on instinct. Oh, it's sad. It's like, a big deal. It that, is a very big deal. After the fact, she just, I mean, when she starts becoming coherent. Don't go after the fact until we're after the fact. Well, what's next? So you have Bellardin and Nightchill. Uh, there's a demon that comes up from the ground. Directly underneath Nightchill. Yeah, and starts ripping her apart. Literally. And Bellardin's like, oh, that's wrong. <laughs> yeah, some magic. He takes his big hands and squashes that thing's head. Lifelong companions, remember. Love is probably an understatement. That was not the only demon on the battlefield. Right. The, the actual soldiers are fighting other demons on the battlefield as well. And shortly after that, the wizard Acheronis has been using his staff of fire to blast Moonspawn when a pair of icy wings spreads out, envelops him, and then crushes him to dust. So we have these uh, soldiers that are running towards the hill where Tattersail is. And since she's wigging out, she isn't able to actually defend them like she's supposed to. She kind of is accepted as one of them. I think it's the second. Yeah. And they have a saying. Always an even trade. So I'm going to do this for you hoping that you're going to do it for me in the end, and she didn't. She did not. And that's not cool, at least well, uh, as far as she's concerned. Well, well, exactly. I think it's important to note that she's kind of like, devastated. She did everything within her power just to keep herself alive. And when she kind of woke up from the, from the conflagration, she looked up and she realized that there were like hundreds and hundreds of soldiers that were running to her for protection. And they're like empty, empty suits of armor, right? Yeah. Th this whole time, all of these wizards are going down and dying and there's chaos. There's demons on the battlefield. And all of this time, Tayshirin has just been blasting and blasting and bla he's never stopped. He's, he's allowed all of that magic to wash off of him, keep him on his knees, but he's just allowed it to kill every soldier around him so that he can continue blasting Moonspawn. And he succeeds. Moonspawn begins to teeter. And it starts to fly away. It leaves pale, exposed. Part of that might be because it is literally ablating. Like so much of Moonspawn, the underside of it, I assume, all that basalt is falling off in fire onto the city of pale. It's probably doing more harm than good at this point. And it's starting to teeter. Yeah, it, but it, it takes off. It leaves. It leaves. And and that's when Tattersail realizes the battle's over, that she's not even fighting anymore. Moonspawn retreats, but at a terrible cost. Tattersail, now alone and dazed and in shock, surveys the destruction. Pale has fallen. All right, so the good guys won. Are they the good guys? <laughs> Let's not worry about that right they kill now. kill their own. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's not looking good. I mean, but I like the Malazans, don't get me wrong. So Tattersail is alive. Tashrin is alive. And... There's a voice that says they're coming, and she looks down, and it's half of Herlock still alive. Yep. He's using his magic to stay alive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Keeping it together. And <laughs> you got to keep it together, man. <laughs> and, and she's, like, freaking out. You know, this battle's just ended. Tattersail, that is. And the people that are coming are three men and one girl. Does she recognize them? I think she does, right? No, she doesn't. In conversation, she finds out that Whiskey Jack is the guy who's kind of leading the three of them, or the four of them. Well, she asks who they are, and he says Ninth Squad the second. She's like, Ninth? You're bridge burners. Yeah, that's how she knew. So she thought, that would make you Whiskey Jack. Right. And then the other two guys are described as being black men. Seven cities, guys. And then, of course, a little girl, like we said. Right. And when they first showed up, Tattersail, because she can sense power... She was kind of under the impression that a deity had just stepped foot on the earth. Yeah, that'll be one of those men. That is incredible. And terrifying. Or is it the girl? She can't pin it. She doesn't know who it's supposed to be. She's like, it can't be. It's something else, obviously. It's not a deity, but... Let's be realistic. But yeah, let's be realistic. We know 
already, I mean, no, we don't know. We have a strong inclination that this is the same Fisher girl that is being used as a pawn by somebody who is so powerful as to be confused with a deity. Well, we will get her name as being sorry. Sure, sure. I think, I think in the very least, she's got an imprint of whatever. She has a few imprints on her. No, yeah. but the, he, here's what I'm getting at is like, I think they have disguised sorry so that she cannot be detected. And by they, you mean Amanis and Cotillion. Right. So what she's really picking up on is Quickbin. She, and she mentions that. And yet Quickbin obviously disguises his own power. But she says... To confuse the issue. There are only a few people in the world that powerful. And she's like, and I know all of them. And she, well, she should. She thinks she does, but she obviously does not. Exactly. Yeah, which is a shock in its own right. And this is a woman who's already in shock. So this is not helping, I'm sure. You know, this has got to, this, the unreality of the situation right here, of what they just... And let's be real clear. How many people died in that battle? How many Malazan foot soldiers died on that battle? Thousand. Well, a lot. 9,000. And the thing is, is that we don't know until just now that there were people underneath the city, too. Yeah. And Tasha, where, where were the bridge burners? The bridge burners were getting caved in. They had been under trying to dig through a glacial moraine to get a gravel pit, essentially, to get to the walls of pale to undermine them. And they'd been doing this for three years. And there was no way they were going to make it. There was no way. And they didn't know about this going on then. 1,400 soldiers were down in those tunnels. And Tashran afterwards was not helping dig anybody out. No, he not only didn't help, he refused to let anybody help them. So these bridge burners and sorry. <laughs> they just came out from underground. Uh, and they're here to help out Hairlock. Because they made a deal. Right. And Herlock went down, we find out later, down to the tunnels, right? Yeah, he was doing errands for Dujek or something. He had an out. Is that what he's calling it? Yeah, ace in the sleeve, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, but whatever. he did that, obviously, because he was, you know, he's covering his own ass. But at the same time, he probably suspected that it was a trap and they were very likely being targeted. Yeah, definitely. Where did the, <laughs> where did the, where did the power come from that took him out? It was not Anamander Rake. He mentioned that, and he's like, he told he had, he told Tattersall that. He's like, where did it come from? Yeah, Quick Ben told him. Quick Ben told her. Hairlock told her. Like, well, actually, I didn't think about that. Hairlock may have told Quick Ben, but she saw, she knew, well, she could tell. There's an important character development here: is she, despite her age, tends to be a little naive, or doesn't pay attention, or doesn't pick up on the subtle details of political drama and betrayal and everything else that goes along with it. She just does not pick up on that kind of stuff. Yeah. Herlock does. Right. But she doesn't. That part about Tashrin not letting anybody help the bridge burners dig out, that was delivered by Sari. Sari told that to Tattersail and is like watching Tattersail's reaction. And Tattersail is like surprised. She's like, what do you mean he wouldn't let anybody help? And she says that it missed the mark. Like she was looking for a reaction and she didn't get the one she was expecting. I think she was trying to see if Tattersail was in on it, if she knew what was going on. And because she didn't, I assume that saved her life right there. <laughs> so what are they doing with Hairlock? How are they going to save this guy? How old is this magic that they say that they're going to do? They say it's elder magic that hasn't been done for 1,000 years. So what are they doing exactly? So well, let's, let's not let, give it away. Let's get back to Quick Ben. Mm -hmm. All right. Is performing a rite that hasn't been performed in a very long time. And she can sense his power. Yeah. It radiates and it hurts. And she doesn't even recognize the warn. Yeah, she doesn't. Yeah, at all. <laughs> She has no idea what's going on. She's like, that's like that, Warren, but it's twisted or something. What the heck is he doing? Yeah, there's a number of times where she's like, what are you people? What are you doing? It's interesting. Largely, they ignore her. Whiskey Jack is the only person that gives her any attention. And really, I think he's just keeping her out of the way so that Quick Ben can do whatever he needs to do with Hairlock. <laughs> he's running interference. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Keep this lady wizard away from me. Yeah, exactly. He's a mage blocker. <laughs> uh, hmm. and, and the entire time Tattersail thinks something is wrong something is not right something is definitely not normal here 
So they're, they've got a, a package, a bundle of something in clothing, and they're doing this spell. They have a little bit of a conversation, and I, the they is Harlock and Quick Ben. What are, were they saying something like, uh, she's going to have to do it? Yes. And talking about Tattersail. Harlock volunteers Tattersail. Yeah, he volunteers her. Volunteer me for what? And I think uh, it's Quick Ben is like, no, it's, it's Kalam. He says, answers are difficult to acquire, but if you want them, take this package. Right. And so he's giving her the choice, buy in or walk away right now. And she buys in. She takes the package off of him. And she like goes to her place. Quickbin kills Hairlock. The rite that he performs, that bundle of something hard like sticks that's wrapped in hides all sewn shut like a cocoon, he places it on Hairlock's chest and he performs some rite. And it's like webs of dark magic flow out from on top of it and cover Hairlock. And then Hairlock like gasps and breathes his last breath and dies. And the whole time Kalam was poised on his, the balls of his feet with his hands up his sleeves waiting. What was going on there? You know, I did not pick up on that. He was waiting for something that didn't, that didn't happen. Like potentially something could have gone bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Afterwards, after the rite has finished and Quick Ben kind of breathes a sigh of relief, he's just done this thing. It's probably not easy. So yeah, Tattersail doesn't think it works. The girl spoke directly behind her in a voice that was sharp and accusing. I don't know what you've done, wizard. I felt you keeping me away. That was unkind. Yeah, I didn't get that. But I don't think she's talking to Tattersail, right? She's no, talking she to is not. Tattersail faces the girl, then glances back at Quick Ben. And Quick Ben looks a little maybe scared. Well, it says uh, his expression was glacial. Yeah, but it did look like fear, yes. The impression that I got was that Kalam was waiting to prevent anybody from interfering. Yeah, well, if he has his hands in his sleeves, there's probably a dagger. What's, well, yeah. why, why, do you, why do you say that, Yule? Uh, because I know future information, I think, <laughs> is what it is. Um, Tattersail described him as being big like a bear, but moving oh, yeah. across a battlefield with such grace, she knew he was dangerous. She said he's a man who has achieved the next level with killing. He enjoys it. Let's get back to what you mentioned a second ago about how sorry was being kept out. Yes. That implies that was intentional. Oh, yeah. I agree. So completely. Quick, Quickbin knows. What do you think Quickbin knows? Quickbin I, doesn't trust her and he's scared of her, but I don't think he knows anything. I suspect he is. Susp I have a note somewhere that says he's susp already suspicious. Well, he is definitely suspicious. What made things even more disturbing? This 15-year-old girl had quick been scared half out of his wits, and the wizard didn't want to talk about it. So he's not talking about it, I assume, because he isn't sure yet. But he definitely suspects something about this girl. It's hard to deny. She's also described as being the same kind of person as Kalam, that comfortable with killing. Way more than a 15 year old girl would ever be capable physically or mentally. Right. Of and doing. so they're on the battlefield speculating about sorry. Like, with her there, too. Yeah, she is there. She I is mean, there. and there's so many times there's a conversation and then they look and they're sorry. Yeah. <laughs> and then when she is there and they know, oh, they're just talking about her like she isn't there. Yeah, and sorry at one point accuses them of bringing unwanted attention down on their squad. Uh, yeah. What was that for? It was because of the wizardry that they're doing. Oh, because of this. Yeah. That's when yeah. she walked in. Yeah, exactly. He's like, you're going to bring attention to us and Just, we don't want uh, that. But sorry, doesn't want that because sorry's bosses don't want that. Right. The point is whiskey, Jack and quick Ben and Colum all know that this girl is not just a girl. She's not what she seems. However, they're still harboring her and protecting her because they, Maybe some how they think she's important. No, nobody trusts this girl. As you say, she's not what she seems. How could they? They don't know her. They've only been working with her for two years. And in that time, nobody's ever gone beyond recruit with her. Quick Ben is scared of her. Um, Kalam is nervous around her. Dude, um, Quick Ben's scared? That's enough for me. Yeah, but Whiskey Jack just talks to her like a normal recruit, right? He says, you got something to say? And she's just like, mm, whatever, <laughs> you know? <laughs> she like ignores him. It's hilarious. Right. Tattersail off with that package. She leaves, right? Yeah. 
And then the Moranth come in. They march into the city. What's going on with that? The Moranth, we find out, have had a real hard time with Pale because of what? Trade routes. Trade disadvantage, yeah. Yeah, and Pale's been beating the Moranth for a long time as far as that's concerned. They were told, because you know they've been giving military stuff to the Malazans, they were told that they were going to get, what, an hour after they took Pale? Yep. That was these deal. fools are going to go in, these Moranth, and they are going to wipe out a, everybody they can in an hour. The estimate is 12,000 people. And they pretty much do it. There's some stuff with Whiskey Jack in that part of the chapter that we're in right now, but overall, it's really a conversation about the Moranth. We were introduced to the Moranth as them being instrumental in changing the shape of warfare. And we don't see that. Not yet. What we see is them standing on a hillside waiting for the battle to end so they can walk in and slaughter people. Civilians. Well, the thing is, is this is black Moranth, and there are other Moranth. Yeah, there's gold and green, and I don't know. Their society is stratified probably much like an insect society, right? Like a hive-minded society. Well, everything about them screams up bugs. You know, they have like this chitinous armor. and Except they, the fact that they're humanoid. Well, yeah. <laughs> I mean, well, I mean, they're underneath this armor and they're talking in clicks and stuff. Yeah. So it's a little strange. It is. It is. I mean, I, I can understand the speculation that they might not be human, but uh, we don't really have good evidence that they aren't. Nevertheless, they're marching into the city to add to the chaos, not take it away. And that's when uh, Whiskey Jack tells three of his remaining seven (laughs) squad members that uh, they've got new orders. Quick Ben responds by saying, look, they're driving us into the ground. We've already got new orders. Somebody wants us dead. Somebody wants the bridge burners dead. Whiskey Jack tells him to shut up. He needs time to think. Go get Fiddler or whatever the hell you have to do still. But I need time to think. And take, take Sorry with you. (laughs) Get her out of here. So he sits down to do some thinking and he's kind of come around. Like all along, he's been told things and he kind of doesn't believe it. He was told a long time ago that Lacine was going to be their problem. He didn't believe it at the time. He got demoted. You know, things have gone the way that they've gone. And now someone's trying to kill the bridge burners. And all the evidence really does stack up to support that assertion. Someone is trying to wipe out the bridge burners to a man. There's only 40 of them left. And there were 1,400 of them this morning. All right, but I got to ask you guys this. The bridge burners have been around for a really long time. They were part of a different army even back in the day. They were part of the third army, I think. They were an elite unit. They were the emperor's own. We learned that in the prologue. If Lacine took over and she wanted to get rid of anybody loyal to the emperor, why would she wait this long to do it? it takes time. Does it? There's been a continuous war. I don't know what to say. Maybe it is silly to think that that's what's going on. I think maybe there's more to it, but I can understand why they would assume that's, that's the only reason behind it. But why now? Well, what happened? What's changed? What's different that they're aware of? I mean, anything? Has anything happened that they're aware of that would no, trigger this? No, I got it. I figured it out. Oh, please do tell. All right. So she didn't like the bridge burners to begin with because they were loyal to the emperor. So she's been giving me the crappy assignments in the world. And then over and over again, over and over and over again, hoping they'll they'll quit. They'll retire. They'll die. Just fade from existence. Right. Because if you destroy the bridge burners, legends, they're legendary. They've mentioned that a few times. These are people that are legendary within the empire. Okay. But when you keep throwing them at the most difficult things and they keep coming out alive, what do you expect to happen? You're just going to build up their legends. Yes. Okay. So the reason they, the reason, the reason they're acting now, the reason they're destroying the whole entire bridge burner brigade, what do you want to call it? They figured out that sorry is with them. Right. And they don't know who sorry is. They just know that sorry is there. So they're going to kill every single one of the bridge burners just to get to her. Yep. Okay. Now, okay. I agree. I think that's, that makes a lot of sense. And I think that we can already see that logically Lauren has figured it out, right? Lauren is capable of figuring that out. So I, I assume that you're correct. Why then go for the wizards? Okay. So let me backtrack slightly. All of the soldiers in Dujek's army were also killed, right? Almost all. Almost all. Very few survived. So let's go back to where she said, I want to go to Dujek's army. Yep. 
So they didn't know who. One we, arms we, host. We assume we assume they we wanted assume. to wipe out one arms host. Exactly. We assume the bridge burners. But right they there. know she's not a wizard. So why kill the wizards? Was that to prevent the wizards from protecting the army? I think because her job, Tattersail views her job not as a destroyer of Moonspawn, but a protector of those people. And she failed, and that's why she's so torn. So did Tashrin manipulate the situation so that she couldn't do her job so that all the soldiers would die? Because why Belurden? Why Nightchill? Who summoned the demons? Who was on the battlefield capable of casting magic at Hairlock? Is there another player? We know the claw were in town. Claws can't uh, cast magic. Oh, really? I don't know. Can they? It's a huge assumption I think you're making. Well, Topper can. He can open a warren. We have no reason to believe that the claw can't cast magic. None. There may be some that can. Callum can't. Can well, he? giving, um, I don't know, but he's hanging out with these guys. Yeah. And a claw may be, a claw may not just be assassins. A claw may have mages, mage assassins too. We know that a high mage has multiple warrens. We also know that there are people extraordinarily talented in the world, like Kalam. What's to say that somebody as talented as Kalam also has access to a warren? Well, there was the recruiting sergeant that recruited Sari. That got Who was sensitive. Yeah, definitely sensitive. So, I mean, I don't know what's going on, but like that's what, that's, my mind is ringing like a bell at the end of this chapter. And this chapter is not even over. Oh my Jesus. So my theory, my two-bit theory, is that Lauren figured out that Sari went to Dujek's army and she wanted to destroy the entire army. Lacine decided to just wipe out the whole host to get to one person. Exactly. That big of a threat. Yep. That big of a threat. Right. It wasn't focused on the bridge burners, but why not, you know, two birds, one stone, that kind of thing. Okay. And, and it failed. And it did fail. The attempt failed. Okay, let's close this chapter out. Back in her tent, Tattersail unwraps a strange package. Okay, so this is kind of, this section is a lot like the section with Perrin on the road before he meets Topper. This is when we get a lot of information about Tattersail's past. We get to understand how she's feeling, how distraught she is about having failed all of those soldiers around her, even though there was nothing she could have done. She feels guilty. She's gnawed by self-doubt and, and self-loathing. And when she comes into her apartment, like she looks at her belongings and thinks of them as just like a waste of time, these trinkets. Everything she sees is just a, a useless toy, except for the deck of dragons. So, Philip, what's a deck of dragons? <laughs> that is a great question. Because I don't fully comprehend the answer, but uh, give but, me give me a closest analog to our reality. It's tarot cards, and they change. If you take a deck of dragons, you can see things that are different every time. Every time they yeah. evolve through time. It's not just how they lay out. Do we know at this point anything more specific about the cards? Because I think we're left in quite a lot of mystery about what's on the cards. We only just now are starting to get a glimpse at what's on the cards. I think we see two cards in this scene. That's that, it. That, that's true. But one important thing is that you have to have a gift for it. Yes. Not all wizards are able to utilize. They're not all practitioners. The deck of dragons is calling to her when she enters, oh, sending out its little tentacles as it were and saying, Hey, pick me up. Let's play. She thinks about picking up the deck and actually working with it. Yeah, she refused it last night, though. She's refused it before. Uh, yes. And yes, right. anytime she does, it seems like something bad happens. Something very specific and bad, actually. Both times that she's recalling, I mean, she's recalling two specific events where she refused to look at the deck when it was calling out to her, and both times the same thing happened. And one was when Dancer... Just Dancer, we don't know. Oh, just Dancer. And then her lover... Dancer cut the throat of her previous lover. Oh, that's what it was. Was also the resident of Mox Hold, where we began the book in the prologue. Mm -hmm. Probably a long time ago. Probably 96 years ago. So who's her lover? Her lover was Mock. Oh. Oh, Mock. I see. Dancer snuck into Mock's Hold, 
probably about 96 years ago at the foundation of the empire, Dancer cut the throat, killed Mock. The empire was founded and originally was headquartered, capitaled at Mock's hold. So it's probably from the very beginning. And then it just happened again. So she was she not only is from before in Kellenved's regime, she was in Mock's regime before yeah. that. Yep. And another she, reason why she thinks she's uh her life is forfeit. It's pretty tragic, really, if you think about it. Just pick yeah. up the cards then. Picking up the cards does not mean you can avoid your fate. Right? That's the whole thing about predestination. Like it's predestined. It doesn't matter if you know. You cannot change it. That's the whole thing about the second card with the spinning coin. Let's do the reading. Let's do the reading. Well, before she does the reading, she decides not to. And then that's when the, that stuff in the... in The, the cocoon. In the, the cocoon, yeah. Yeah, it, it starts, starts to move. starts moving. And she unwraps it, and she sees a marionette that looks just like Herlock. It speaks like Herlock, and it says, Hey, Sale. And she's like, oh, it did work. Your back door worked. Herlock is alive, so to speak. It's called soul shifting. He's, yeah, he's now in an inanimate object, but he's motile. He's able to move around. He controls that body fully. He inspects himself. He holds out his arms, looks at his hands, and he's like, well, what can you expect? You know, it's better than nothing. And then he tells Tattersail, pick up the cards. You're reading. Do it. You're reading. Hurry up. You're too slow, Tattersail. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. As she's inspecting it, he's like, next card. Card number one is the Knight of Darkness. She flips it over. It's some muscly, naked dude with white hair, black skin. Lower half of his body's a reptile. Dragonian, I believe she described it. Scales on the belly are kind of graying. He's got a huge black sword dripping with chains and there's something floating over his head. Philip mentioned just a minute ago that every reading was a little different. And this is the thing that's different for Tattersail. That thing floating over this guy's head, whose face is obscured, by the way. There's no definition to the face. That thing floating over the head has never been there before. Tattersail has probably been a practitioner since she was a child 200 years ago. She's never seen that. What do you all interpret here? What are you pulling out of this? It's the thing I think floating is Moonspawn. I, I am very suspicious also that that's Moonspawn and that the Night of Dark would then be Anamanda Rake. Spoiler alert. We know this is Anamanda Rake. The sword that has the chains in it. Yeah. This, yeah. Is, yeah, this is that sword, Dragnapur or whatever the hell his name is. Okay, so she flips the second coin because Hairlock's in a hurry. He's like, hurry up, dummy. And the second card is a pawn. O pawn? Oh, Herlock does not like this card. He's like, Herd, Hood's curse upon those twins. Who is Opon? All right, so what is he's the god of luck? Gods. Gods of luck. Twins. So the, um, the card is on the top part is a woman. Yes, in this case. Right, and on the bottom part, it's a man. Right, just like a, the face card is in a regular playing deck. She hears something. And it sounds like a, a a coin spinning. She asks if he know if she, he can hear this. Yeah. Do you do you hear anything, Herlock? And he's he like, doesn't. He's like, no. turn the card. No, shut up, lady. Keep going. You're too Next slow. Card. Next card. And yeah, he's in a real hurry. And then the man's hand is reaching up towards the woman's hand. She notices something in between their hands. So she covers it up just in case Herlock does see it. Yeah, she slams her hand down and refuses the reading. Oh, come on. You were supposed to do another card. And she's all, no. And what she saw was a coin, and it was spinning. And it was spinning from male to female, a man's face to a woman's face, to a man's face to a woman's face. Let's go back to predestination, etc. Something has been unde Something is undecided at this point. And Opon has the ability to, to teeter or totter. I mean, that's how I'm interpreting what's going on here. I don't know what it is, but they're definitely involved and they have not decided how they're going to play it yet. And they're based on chance. They're the fool. They're the ones that do or don't on whimsy. That's Opon. But the lady is up right now, which indicates success. Thus the thread of luck that pulled back rather than pushed forward, the thread of success. I suppose the other thread would be failure. I don't know. Two sides of a coin, success and failure, right? Success 
but something's undecided and Hairlock can't see it. Can't hear it. He's unaware. He wants more information. He doesn't have enough information to suit his fancy, but Tattersail stops the reading. She slams her hand down on the cards because she knows she's already got one leg up on Hairlock, who is a rival. Let's be honest. If she finds out, then she knows. And then it's set in stone. It's like when you flip the coin and it's in the air, you don't know yet. It could go either way. And that's how it is right now at the end of this chapter. You can hear it spinning. She can hear it spinning. I think that's kind of where we're left, fellas. Uh, End of chapter two. I think we've done our job. I hope we've done our job. I hope that anybody listening to this was able to take away more than an initial first reading alone would have allowed. That was the goal. I don't know if we stated that clearly in the beginning, but that was the goal. It was also, you know, I wanted to talk to my my friends about this book because we have been waiting years to do this. Yule read these books years before I did. I've read them all years before Philip has. Like, we're just, it's like been 15 years for crying out loud. We're just now getting to sit down and talk about these books. And all along, Yule's been like, man, we should do a show about this book. I'm like, you know what? That's a really good idea. That's a foolish move. Why would we ever do something like that? What a beast of a book this is, though. Oh, we have two chapters. I can't believe all this stuff that we're plumbing through this. I mean, we missed so much, I'm sure. I'm sure we did. And we've done this twice. This is our second take. <laughs> and we still miss stuff. It's a guarantee. <laughs> but it is it is a beast of a book, right? I, yeah, this is the easy one. This is the most... I mean... I'll say accessible. Well, uh, it's, it's, so like later books, what happens is there's a lot of the same stuff going on and it's more of that. Yes. This is a nice little, you know, a procedural, we're going to get the nice little love story going forward. And it's just a kind of neat little novel that is, uh, you can read by itself, but once you get to the other ones, you got to keep reading. No, that's true. That's true. This book sets up the rules for us. And though we may struggle, once we understand the rules, we'll understand all the rest of the books pretty well. Although keeping track of all of the details for all 10 books, I would say is nigh impossible without the aid of a very detailed spreadsheet or a wiki page or something like that, which there is a good wiki. I highly recommend anybody listening, check it out uh, to assist in the under- better understanding of these books and to answer questions that you may have that we didn't answer. Or ask questions, maybe we can answer them. Yeah, if you, uh, yes, please, a reminder, if you know something that we don't know, if you figured something out, and don't go cheating and look up the wiki and then tell us, because we could do that too, we're choosing not to. But nevertheless, give us anything. If you know something that we don't know, tell us tell us we do want to know even though we will hate you for knowing it and we know, and we not knowing it you know we'll hate you for that i will love you for that philip will love you long time no matter what you do okay that's a threat just putting that out there going forward the next episode we'll get to it as soon as we can honest to god i don't know when that will be but we're gonna do it the same way we did this one same format everything's basically the same same participants about the same length probably I'm looking forward to it. What about you guys? Ooh, it's going to pick up. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us on this, the premiere episode of Gardens of the Moon, the discussion. <laughs> it's over. We're going to do it again as soon as we can. Uh, stay tuned, follow, subscribe, do all the things that we normally do to support stuff that you like. If you don't like it, I'm really sorry, but get out of here. And um, yeah, we'll see you in the next one. Take care. <laughs>